Welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Um, today is the 22nd, so we're going to be talking about some uh, Prismata AI. For those of you who've been uh, following along, you may notice that we sort of missed a week of lectures here. Uh, apologies for that. I'm sure the students are very disappointed that they uh, didn't have to listen to me talk for a whole week, but I had a pretty serious wisdom tooth issue and I just wasn't able to lecture. So that quiz uh, is moved. So let's just uh, delete that. And now Q8 or Q7 is going to be uh, down here after this set of lectures. And just to let people know that the last two weeks of lectures in the class, I think are going to be really fun. Um, they're actually special guest lectures. Um, not that a special guest will be giving the lecture, but all of these will be um, people in AI, either in academia or in industry or a mix of both, who will be... Um, I'll be doing sort of an interview style lecture where we're going to sit together, sit down for an hour and talk about what they do and the sort of problems that they run into in everyday life. So this will be a really um, interesting set of lectures. And then I'm going to have quizzes about those, um, the answers to those questions in those interviews, etc. But today I am going to be talking about um, Prismata AI. So I'm sure all of you are saying, well, what the hell is Prismata and why do we need to know about its AI system? Well, if I bring this up here, Prismata is a game, and that game is on Steam. Prismata is a, it's a really good strategy game, and unfortunately, it wasn't um, financially as successful as the game should have been, in my opinion. Uh, I worked with uh, Lunark Studios, the company who made Prismata, and I was the AI developer for the game. So I was lucky enough during my PhD work um, six or seven years ago to be able to apply the things that I did during my PhD to an actual retail game, which was really fun. And that game was Prismata. So, um, yeah, someone out there in the chat, uh, says that they know Alex. Yeah. Alex was, uh, one of the founding members of the Prismata team. So that's awesome. Uh, I know Alex and, uh, he's a, he's a great person. So Alex and Elliot and David and, and all those guys um, and Will all worked on the game and I, I did the AI system for the game. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that game, play through a couple of games so that you get a feel for the rules. And then I have uh, this talk here. So at GDC 2017, I actually gave a talk um, at GDC about the AI system for the game. So I'm going to give that talk for you guys and um, show you how it sort of rolls over. So it, this was sort of the next step after the StarCraft AI stuff. And um, so the StarCraft AI stuff that I talked about a couple of lectures ago, um, this is this is sort of an extension of that and sort of the, the logical next step of that stuff. So here's the, uh, the interface for the game. You can play it, it's still on Steam if you wanna go play it. Um, I may have some, uh, some Steam keys left over, but uh, you're welcome to go play it. So let's go into the battle menu here where you can do a quick play. Now, of course, this is a player versus player. You can join the ranked ladder and, and play games and stuff. But uh, I'm going to be focusing on the AI. So here you can see that there's a bunch of different um, AI settings for the bot. So a bunch of different difficulty settings. So here we have... Um, a, a number of different difficulty settings that was intended um, by the designers of the game so that the AI system would be a gradual introduction to the rules of the game, right? So, for example, you can play against an AI that just never attacks, so you can't die, right? Um, there's another bot that does, like, random things. There's a, a basic bot that does very, very simple things all the way up to this, like, master bot. So I'm going to show you the rules of the game now, and then we'll get into the AI system so you can see um, how I built it so that this sort of, there's a, there's a really modular approach to the back end of the AI that makes making these difficulty settings really, really easy. So first, let's, uh, let's, let's load up a game versus the pacifist bot so that I can just show you um, sort of the really basic rules of the game. So the game is sort of like the working title for Prismata before it became Prismata, like back in the pre-alpha days, was called MCDS, which stood for, the M was Magic the Gathering, C was Chess, D was Dominion, and S was Starcraft. So there's lots of different ways that you can view this game, but the properties of the game are 
that it's two player. So down here are my units and up here are my opponent's units. So it's got that Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone type feel where it's my cards versus your cards. Um, it's a deterministic game. So in the game, um, there's no randomness beyond the starting set of units that are purchasable. So when you play the game, your job is to generate resources and buy more units that you then use to generate more resources and eventually defend and attack, okay? And the object is to kill all of the units of your opponents that, that your opponent controls. So it's kind of like StarCraft in that way. So it's got a real real-time strategy game <clears throat> um, feel to it, but it's turn-based. So think of, like, it's like Magic the Gathering meets turn-based StarCraft, okay? Um, so the way you interact with the game is I have my units right here. And so these are drone units. So if I hover over a unit here, it shows you all the different properties of this unit. So uh, in the bottom right, you can see this plus sign with a one, that's that the unit has one health. Um, if you click this unit, you gain one gold. I'll talk about resources in a second. In the top right, you see three gold and one lightning bolt, that's energy. So that's how much this unit costs to purchase. Up at the top, you can see that this is a blocker unit, and then it's got some, some fancy art in the middle of it. So I talked about resources. Down here in the bottom left, I've got a number of different resources in this game. So if you think about something like um, Magic the Gathering, right, you've got different types of mana that you can produce by tapping different lands. So an island would tap for blue, um, a swamp would tap for black, you could have colorless mana, all sorts of different mana types. And that's basically the same idea in this game. So we've got uh, gold, we've got three different resources, um, Gaussite, uh, Bohemium, and Replicates. So we just call them green, blue, and red. Um, and then energy. So these are different types of resources that you can produce, and then you can use those resources either to purchase new units or some abilities of some units cost resources in order to, to spend. Okay, so uh, we've got gold, green, blue, red, and energy. So here um, I've got this, this sort of set of units that's purchasable. So the D part of MCDS was Dominion. If you've ever played the card game Dominion, that's sort of what this is like. So in every single game of uh, Prismata, you have uh, the base set of cards. So that's 11 cards or units that are purchasable all the time in every game. And then every game has a randomized set of units that you can purchase as well. So in this set, we've randomly chosen this set of five units. So we'd call this game type base plus five because it has five random cards. So those random cards are typically quote unquote more powerful than the base set of cards, right? So you do want to purchase these, these new cards. Now I'm swapping back and forth between tabs, but I can just have them both open like this. So this first column, they'll be purchasable in every single game that you play. And then this these five cards here are randomized in every single game that you play. And we have, you know, something like 200 different, different randomized cards that these could be. And it really adds like, just like the game Dominion, it adds new strategy, choices and, and no game is, you know, no two games are ever the same because of that randomized thing. Okay, so how do you start off the game? Well, I've got some drones here and if I click a drone, you can see that I get one gold from clicking that drone because the ability of a drone is click it to gain one. If I click it again, it sort of unclicks it, right? So it's kind of like Magic the Gathering where it could be tapped or untapped. And just like Magic the Gathering, if I tap a creature to use its ability, it can no longer block. Okay, so I can no longer, this symbol up here is now grayed out, meaning I can't use this creature to block if I want to. So, of course, it would be annoying if I had to click every single one of these, so I can just click and drag or swipe to use all of my drone's abilities, and then I'll get six gold from that. Um, I have two more units on the field that are engineers. And the, the ability of an engineer is that at the start of the turn, you gain an energy, okay? So if I've clicked six drones and I have two engineers, then um, at the start of my turn, my engineers gave me one energy each and my drones gave me six gold. So over here now highlighted in orange are the units that I have the resources available to purchase, okay? So just like StarCraft, um, you have choices to make. You could either 
um, go for attacking really early, go for defense, or typically what you want to do in Prismata is purchase some more workers, right? Some more drones so that you can, um, you can have more to spend on the next turn, right? So you want to build up your economy before you build up anything else. So here, um, after I've purchased those two drones, I get this little uh, symbol here, which means those drones will be um, available for use on the next turn. So I can't use those until the next turn of the game. And then I'm going to end my turn because I've spent all of my resources. And now the AI is thinking of what to do. And the AI has all also bought two drones, okay? So there's a shortcut of a Q on the keyboard that uh, taps all my uh, drones for me. So I'm just going to do that. And then what I can do is uh, let's, instead of just purchasing two more drones, let's buy, uh, so I have eight. So I'll buy a drone and a Blast Forge. So a Blast Forge um, gives me a blue resource at the start of every turn. So uh, if I want to get green, blue, or red resources, I can buy a Conduit, a Blast Forge, or an Animus. So these give me those resources. Um, one thing I didn't mention about resources is that um, gold and green, they're accumulated. So those do not get removed at the end of a turn, unlike mana in Magic the Gathering. But, uh, sorry, but blue, red, and energy are removed at the end of a turn. So if you, if you produce green, but you don't spend it, it'll be there the next turn. If you produce blue and you don't spend it, it won't be there the next turn. So I, brought, I bought a Blast Forge. Let's see what I can do with that. And I've spent all my resources, so I'm going to pass. And now what is my opponent going to do? They're going to buy a Conduit. So the, the AI bought a Conduit, and with a Conduit, they can produce green units. Okay. So on my turn, now I have um, one blue, nine gold, and two energy. So what I could do here, I can buy a Steel Splitter unit. So a Steel Splitter unit is sort of this um, basic unit in the game. It has three health and I can click it to gain an attack. So I'm going to click this so that I can gain a, gain attack to show you what attacking units do in the game. And I'm going to use my remaining three gold to buy another drone. So here we go. You can start to see where the strategy in this game uh, is formed. So my uh, opponent here bought two drones and a blast forge. So I'm going to use all my drones. And then what I'm going to do is maybe I will buy an animus and a drone so I can get some red out. And now is where the attacking and defending mechanics come into the game. And this is where it gets a little bit different than any other game that you've played. So in Magic the Gathering, what you sort of do is you just attack with a certain number of units, right? So I'm going to have like three creatures attacking, for example. Then what your opponent would do in Magic is assign blockers to each of those attackers, right? In this And, and in Hearthstone, what you do is instead of just attacking with something, you attack with something and you choose a target that you're attacking with, right? In in Prismata, it's different than, in, than both of those games. So in Prismata, you produce, if I click this, I produce one attack. I don't get to say where it goes. So once I pass my turn, my opponent, the way the opponent defends in Prismata is that all of the incoming damage, so this one incoming damage, the opponent gets to assign it to their units in any way that they wish among defenders. So this is, the rules of the game are a little complex, but I do want to explain them to you before I explain the AI system. So if I pass the turn now, there'll be one attack going over. The only blockers available for the opponent are these two engineers. So essentially, the engineers have one hit point each, so they will assign one damage to one of the engineers and that engineer will die, okay? However, if that pl player had, just like in Magic the Gathering, if the creature does not take lethal damage, it survives, okay? So for example, if they had a Steel Splitter or a Wall available, which have three health, they could assign one damage to a three health creature and then it would survive and it essentially would just absorb that damage. So here we go. I'm going to end the turn. There's one damage going from me to the opponent. It's going to block it with an engineer. The engineer dies. And now my opponent bought a wall. Okay. So it bought a wall because now when I, if I attack for one, 
it can assign that one damage to the wall and the wall won't, it's not going to go to two, it'll just stay at three, right? So here, uh, I have two red now, so I can buy two Tarsiers. Tarsiers are these uh, things that produce attack at the start of every turn. So I've attacked for one, uh, which is kind of useless because my opponent can basically absorb it. So they assign one damage to the wall, nothing happens, and then they go on with their turn. So they're buying lots more resources. Uh, my Tarsiers take two turns to activate. So um, let me... Hmm... I'm going to show you something a little bit more complex now, just so you can see how deep the strategy in this game goes. So here we go. I'm going to buy a conduit. Actually, I'm going to buy two conduits. And oops, I didn't want to buy two conduits. What am I going to do here? Okay, so I'm going to buy a Gaussite symbiote and a conduit. All right. So I'm going to pass the turn and see what the opponent does. I just want to show you this enemy because uh, it's really powerful. Or it's it's really complex in what it does. Um, I'll also buy a Tesla coil on this turn, and I'll buy another engineer. Pass the turn again. So these three damage that I have now are going to be put into this five, um, five health blocker. All right. So let's see here. What can I do on this turn? Well, this Tesla coil, if I hover over it, Oh no, <laughs> my ca camera's in the way. Let me move this over a little bit. So, what's going on here? Okay, so you can see it now. So if I mouse over the Tesla coil, it says, when bot, construct two engineers, and you click it to consume an engineer to gain three attack, okay? So if I attack with this unit, it's going to kill one of my engineers, but it produces six attack, which is a lot, okay? So there's there's all sorts of crazy stuff that can happen in the game. This unit, at the start of my turn, gets one attack, but I can spend green to sacrifice it and build more attack. So let's see how this game ends up playing out. So my opponent is going for more defense. I'm going for more offense. I'm going to produce um, six attack here. So we'll see how the opponent spreads out six attack. The opponent says beep boop, because it's an AI system, and it ends up killing two engineers and spreading out the rest. All right, now we're going to attack for nine. I'm going to build um, some more attacking units here. Let's see, what else can I build? Okay, so it's telling me that on the next turn, my opponent is going to be attacking for five. I only have four defense, so what I should actually do here is build a wall. So I'm attacking for ten. My opponent has 11 defense, so it's going to block with stuff. And now we go back and forth and back and forth. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go all in here and see if I end up winning the game, which I probably won't, but I want to show you the end of the game. I have not played with optimal strategy here whatsoever. All right, so I'm going to attack. It's sort of like an all-in attack for 17. I'm not going to buy anything. I just want to show you the end of the game. Okay, so my opponent... Um, is going to win at this point because I haven't been buying anything and I'm going to show you how I assign damage here. Oh yeah, the opponent doesn't actually attack in, in this game. Okay, I forgot it was the pacifist bot. But anyway, I'm just going to resign so that you, now you sort of know the rules of the game. Okay, so uh, I'm going to return to the lobby. So those are the rules of the game. There are more complex things that can happen. There are sort of like combos that you can purchase, that you can uh, get in the game. There's something called freeze where you can assign freeze to opponent units and they can't block and all that sorts of crazy stuff. So, so that's the game of Prismata. I'm not here to promote it financially. I just wanted you to, uh, to see that game so that you know the rules. And now I'm going to get into the talk that I gave at GDC, um, about the AI system. So you can see how the AI system actually works. All right. So playing your cards right, the hierarchical portfolio search AI of Prismata. So the AI system that I created for Prismata is this new search system and it's called hierarchical portfolio search. Okay. So of course, at the beginning of the, the talk, I had to explain the rules of Prismata. Um, so, you know, it's a two player game. It has alternating turns. Um, player 1's units are down here, player 2's units are up here, they have resources, we can click units to gather resources, you can um, buy units, 
you can click to purchase and it's perfect information meaning there's no hidden information there's no cards in the hands here there's no decks to build and it has deterministic gameplay okay <clears throat> excuse me so we all know that because um we just showed you the rules for the game all right so Whenever you make an AI system for an actual retail game, you have to have design goals in mind. You can't just go make it, right? This is an actual game that's out there trying to make money. So the very, very first thing that we wanted to do was that Prismata, as you see, has some complicated rules. And so we wanted the AI system to be first and foremost a tutorial system for new players to get used to the game and develop their own strategies. So it has a steep learning curve and we wanted the AI to guide it um, along that. So that, that tells me immediately that I can't just go use like Minimax and make the best possible system, right? Because it has to be something that won't absolutely destroy new players. Um, also, it, it should, if, it, if you wanted to, give an experienced player um, the opportunity to play well, right? So it should be able to play well if you're playing against someone who isn't a new player, right? We didn't, you know, have a goal in mind to make this like the AlphaGo of, of Prismata. Now, it would be great if I could have produced a system that was like superhuman, but it does take you like a, maybe several dozen or a hundred games of Prismata to get as good as the AI system. Right? So it's good enough so that it, it teaches you the rules of the game, essentially. Um, we wanted it to be in, like make the single player game much more enjoyable. Um, so it had to have some replay value. So maybe it doesn't do the same thing every time. And we wanted it to have a modular design because we're going to have these AI difficulty settings. Like we want a really easy bot to play against a new player. And we want a more like a harder bot to play against more experienced players. And also something that's really important is that because this is an online competitive game, it's going to be balance patched a lot. Like there was a period where we were um, putting out patches for the game and balance patches like weekly, right? So you can't just hard code build orders for the AI because <clears throat> if the cost of a unit changes, that build order might not be possible anymore, right? So the system can't be hard-coded. Uh, maybe like a little bit, but it can't be just like if statements, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me, something in my throat. So the AI system choice that I made for the game was based on my experience with other games, right? So other strategic games use search algorithms. So the reason I didn't use something like deep learning um, or deep reinforcement learning for this game is A... Uh, because I wasn't an expert in that. B, because training time takes way too long. C, it's an indie game startup. We don't have the resources of Google to like apply deep learning to such a huge game. And D, even if we had all of those things, the game is balance patched so often that we would be retraining our neural net weekly. And that thing might be gigabytes in size, which is larger than the game itself. So it was completely infeasible to, to go with a completely learned approach for this game. So what I did was I tried Alpha Beta and Monte Carlo Tree Search. But why is this actually difficult, right? Why is using search for a strategy game AI so difficult? Well, we've seen this problem before in StarCraft, but it, it manifests itself in almost every strategy game. The first thing is the complexity of the game. So the number of possible states there are in a game of Prismata is gigantic, okay? So units, you can have dozens of units, maybe even hundreds of units on a, on a Prismata board. Each of those units has properties, right? So not only can you have hundreds of units that you have to control, but each of those units can have different hit point amounts. They can have ability status like clicked or not clicked. They can have status effects, like they could be chilled or unchilled. They could have different amounts of build time. They could have different charges remaining. Like a very conservative, a very, very conservative lower bound for the number of states in a game of Prismata is like 10 to the power of 120. 
It's like on the order. It's it's bigger than chess, but you you can't just do a search on the whole game state and hope to like solve this game, right? It's it's very very big. It's very big. You can't just like exhaustively search it all. And also on top of that, we have the same multi-unit control problem as we had in StarCraft. So we have different actions for each unit, but a player move, like StarCraft, is actually an assignment of an action to each unit. So if I have U units and A actions per unit, then I actually have A to the power of U possible actions, right? So we saw this for StarCraft, it applies to Prismata as well. So my search algorithm, whether I use Monte Carlo Tree Search or Alpha Beta or Minimax or whatever, there's millions, possibly millions of moves that I could do at any given time. And so I can't escape the first depth, right? So the first thing I have to do to create an, a search-based AI system for this game is to reduce the number of actions that I look at, right? Just like StarCraft, I have to do that for this game as well. So how do I actually handle the large number of actions that are in this game? Well, the solution to that is hierarchical portfolio search. So if you haven't watched my previous lecture where I talked about my StarCraft AI um, research, where I control my units using something called portfolio greedy search, I would go look at that first before you continue watching this, um, especially if you're watching on YouTube, um, because this sort of builds on the idea that was presented in portfolio greedy search, except it's just a little bit more complicated. So what we're going to do is instead of looking over every possible action that there could be done in a game, I'm going to generate those actions or those moves using a portfolio, right? So in PGS, previously for StarCraft, that portfolio was just a number of scripted solutions. And then based on, but, but in, you're going to see in, in hierarchical portfolio search, the reason it's called hierarchical is because these individual actions are actually generated using other search algorithms. So search generates actions, and then we search over those actions. And so it's sort of this hierarchical um, system. And then based on those actions, we apply a high level search to those actions in order to get the action that we actually want to do in the game, okay? So the way this all works at a very high level abstract way we look at the components, is that there's a current game state, we call that S. This is S, the state of the game. I have a bunch of different actions in the game, like clicking on a unit, for example. And a move in the game is an ordered sequence of actions. Okay, so I'm gonna click this unit, then click this unit, then click this unit, then click this unit. Okay, so those are the, those are the first three components. Next, I'm going to have something that I call a player function, okay? So the player function, I'm gonna call that P. And it's going to generate a move. So remember, a move is an ordered sequence of actions that ends with me passing the turn. So it's gonna be click this, click this, click this, pass. That's a move. So this player function P is going to take as input a state and as output return a move. Right, so I pass in a player function, a state, and the output is a move. That's pretty, pretty simple. So input state s, this function, however complicated it may be, is gonna perform the move decision logic, and it's going to return move m that's generated by player p at state s. Okay. The next thing I have is called a partial player function. So a partial player function, or pp, the, you input a state S, and it's going to generate tactical moves for a specific phase of the game or for specific types of unit in the game, okay? So a partial player is going to generate actions for a specific phase of the game. So for Prismata, what does that mean? Well, Prismata, just like if we think of Magic the Gathering, right? Magic the Gathering has a number of different game phases. Like we have the untap phase, upkeep phase, draw phase, main phase one, attacking phase, defending phase, main phase two, end step. Like, like there's lots of different phases that are very specifically defined within uh, Magic the Gathering. So in Prismata, there are phases as well. So for example, at the beginning of a turn, there's a defense phase. 
Um, then you get the chance to do abilities and buy units. And then there's a final phase where if I have more attack than you have defense, then I get to breach your units by assigning damage to them. So Prismata has very similar phases to Magic the Gathering, okay? So the partial players that I talked about, for example, are going to be functions that generate actions or moves, partial moves for a turn based on the phase of the game. So for example, um, I might have a function or a search algorithm or whatever, uh, a partial player that when I go to defend, tries to minimize the amount of cost loss from that defensive selection, right? So for example, if I have 10 attack coming towards me, how do I assign that attack to my defending units such that I minimize the loss of cost of my units? Or maybe another idea would be, um, I want to save as much attack as I possibly can when I assign this defense, right? Um, for the ability phase, maybe I have one partial player that just attacks with everything. Or I attack with everything except blockers. Or I attack with nothing, right? So these are partial players that, um, that do these things. Um, for the purchasing phase, maybe I want to buy as much attack as possible. Or maybe I want to buy as much defense as possible. Or maybe I just want to buy, like, spend as many resources as possible, right? So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a portfolio. Okay, so I for every phase of the game, I have a number of different behavioured functions called partial players that can return tactical moves for me for those specific sub-phases of the game, right? So that's called my portfolio. And then if I want to generate a player move for a turn, all I have to do is choose exactly one of these for each phase of the game. Okay, so one player move for a turn might be uh, the min cost defense partial player, then attack all, then buy attack, and then breach cost. Okay, so that might be, that. that's how I would form a full player move for a full turn out of these partial players. Now, this works really well for Prismata. It would work really well for something like Magic the Gathering. But how could you do this for other games? Right? So for example, StarCraft uh, doesn't have these phases that you can like break the game down into. However, you don't necessarily need to apply the partial players to phases of the game. For StarCraft, what you could do is create a portfolio for each possible unit type, for example. And then you could make these assignments to different unit types and that would be a player move for the game. And, and the cool thing here is that if you have something like StarCraft, you probably already have a bunch of scripts or algorithms to guide specific unit types. So one of the, the cool parts of HPS is that you can use your existing AI system to like build it into this HPS thing. So I hope you're following along so far, but we have this player generates something for an entire, a move for an entire turn, and the partial player generates a sort of sub move for either a specific phase of the game or a specific unit type in the game. All right. So HPS is going to take in a portfolio. It's going to take in uh, a game state and it's going to take in an algorithm. Someone just joined and said, what's HPS? It's a search algorithm that I used for the game called Prismata. Um, not going to explain it again because I just started explaining it, but just watch the, the video afterwards. So the portfolio is a number of these behaviors. I just explained that. The game state can be any state of the game at any time. And the high level search algorithm is going to be something like Monte Carlo Tree Search or, um, or Alpha Beta or something like that. So again, we're going to generate those actions, moves, using our portfolio. And we're going to do the high level search. So how do I actually generate those moves that I'm going to look over to do the search? Well, turns out to be really, really easy. So let's say, for example, I have um, this as my portfolio. So this is actually quite similar to the actual portfolio that is present in the game of Prismata, okay? So I have a few different partial players for defense, a few, a few different ones for ability, a few different ones for uh, purchasing and a few different ones for breaching. 
So what I do essentially to generate all the possible moves that this portfolio would produce, then what happens is I'm just going to do all possible permutations of the things in the portfolio using one from each, right? So if I have two defense, three ability, four attack, and two breach, then that's two times three. So that's six times four, 24 times two, which is 48. So I have 48 possible moves that I can generate from this portfolio. So 48 is a lot less than millions, right? So what I do is this is going to be the first move that I generate. Then I'm gonna generate this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, right? All the way up until N. So that would be the 48th move here. Now, some of these actions that are generated will actually be identical, right? Because for example, um, if I, let's say, um, buy attackers, right? If I have something that buys the most possible attackers, or I have something that just buys the most stuff, it's possible that those actually do the same thing, right? So what I actually do when I generate a move, before I put it into the list of moves, I check to see that they haven't generated the exact same thing, right? So for example, if I have like 48 possible permutations of this portfolio, it's very likely that I only generate between five and 10 actual different unique sequences of actions. So it's even less than this number would suggest. So now I have my actions and then I apply a high level search algorithm to this. That's it. That's the whole system. So the high level search algorithm, you can use whatever algorithm you want. Um, Prismata uses uh, three different search algorithms. We use Monte Carlo tree search, we use alpha beta, and we use a random selection. Other possibilities, you could use hill climbing, you could use a genetic algorithm, you could use machine learning or reinforcement learning. You could go crazy with all the different stuff that you want to uh, that you want a different try that you want to try. Now we talked about this for StarCraft as well uh, in the last lecture, but how do you do state evaluation in Prismata? So state evaluation is a difficult problem, right? So if I look at the state of a board. Uh, consider, so for example, state evaluation is, is, is useful because you can't search every possible state to the end of the game. The game is just too big. So if you could search to the end of the game, you'd just see who won or who lost. But oftentimes you get to these leaf nodes that are not the end of the game and you have to sort of guess, okay, who's winning or who's losing, right? So what we tried in, in Prismata at first was a formula-based evaluation. Now, formula-based evaluation worked kind of okay in Prismata. Um, you can do something like, there's some heuristics that can use. Um, so for example, in Prismata, you have three different uh, main categories of stuff that you're building up. So you have like income or economy, you have blockers or defense, and you have attackers, right? So typically in a game of Prismata, you're leading, you're, you're beating your opponent in some of those three areas, right? So maybe you have more economy, but they have more attack, right? Meaning that you can buy defenders, but they're putting pressure on you. So one of the formulas that actually works really, really well is that if you have more income and more defense and more attack than your opponent, then it's, there's basically no way for your opponent to come back from that, right? Because if you're leading in all three things, then you're pretty much just winning. But that's not usually the case. Um, so we tried things like, you know, the difference in total unit counts, the difference in total, like, um, stuff spent on, uh, resources spent on units, but it, it didn't work that well. We tried random playouts where, where players do random moves. That, that didn't work very well. So what we did was we did the same thing we did in Prismata, where I take a, a fast but semi-intelligent scripted player and play that scripted player against the other player's scripted player, right? And it's basically like buy everything that you can, attack with everything that you can, assign defense in a, assign defense and breach in like a somewhat um, intelligent way. And so you're saying if we both play out the game using this simple behavior from this point on to the end of the game, then the winner of that is probably in the lead, 
And that worked better than random playouts and it worked better than the formula-based evaluation. So that's what we chose. Okay, so that's how the system works. But what about AI difficulty settings? What about this modular design that I, you know, I was really proud of? Okay, so the, the cool thing was, so the way that I did the hardest bot in the game, the master bot, was I took this portfolio and I applied either a three second or a seven second Monte Carlo tree search to the bot, right? So we have seven seconds of thinking of Monte Carlo tree search applied to the moves that, that are generated by this portfolio. That is the most difficult AI setting in Prismata. All right, now, how can I get different difficulty settings? Well, you could say, for example, well, I could just reduce the time right? Reduce the time search. That is one way to do it. But what I did was the expert bot, for example, just does a depth to alpha beta search. So instead of taking seven full seconds to do a search and maybe getting to depth five or six, alpha beta does a depth, a fixed depth to search. So it looks at the things that I can do, and then it looks at the things the opponent can do, and then it returns the move based on that. The next lower difficulty setting is the medium bot. And what the medium bot does is instead of doing a search on this portfolio, it just takes a random choice from the portfolio, right? So all the things in the portfolio are semi-intelligent. So medium bot isn't going to make like insane blunders, but it's certainly not looking at what's the best thing it could do. It's just taking a random choice from all of these things, okay? Now, for the easy bot, all I had to do was take away some of the intelligent stuff from the portfolio. So now it just takes a random thing from this portfolio, right? So I had all of these intelligent things in the harder portfolio. Now I have an easier portfolio, which the easy bot uses. So it, it, it cannot generate these really intense intelligent moves. And then the pacifist bot, all it does is it makes sure that the that the AI can never attack, right? So I removed all of the attacking actions from the portfolio, and now I know that the bot, the bot can never attack. So it's really cool. This portfolio lets you completely compartmentalize and modularize your AI system so that you can like add or remove different behaviors that the search will then look at and say, which is the best thing that I can do, okay? So I thought that was pretty neat. It worked out really well. Um, so the benefits of this system is that the search adapts to dynamic scenarios, right? The AI can rush, it can econ, it can defend. None of those things are hard coded, but if you want to hard code them, you can. So the AI system was made so that you can put in hard coded build orders if you really want to. And for some of the, um, the single player story missions, they actually did that. They hard coded some build orders. And so these things are automatically determined from the search. Um, also, emergent behavior is really scary, right? You don't want the AI to do whatever it wants. And so you can use the portfolio of HPS to make sure that the AI is only selecting from a set of known actions. Right? So if you're doing this for like first person shooter game, you know that your AI isn't going to be like bouncing a grenade off three walls to land perfectly on the player's head, right? Because you, you haven't added those possible actions to the portfolio. And it's also really designer friendly. So this is a problem in AI systems is that um, some, a lot of the times the AI system can't really be understood by the designers of the game. And at some point, I sort of wanted to wash my hands of this, hand them the AI system, and then say, as the designers now, you can tweak this. And the designers of the game understood the portfolio really well. They can just plug and play their own little modules here, and, and it just works, right? So it's really designer friendly, and they can tweak those portfolios to their heart's content and make the AI as easy or as hard as they want. So that was my design. How did I test to see if it actually worked, right? How did I... How did I do this? How did I test? Okay. So the experiments that I ran were as follows. I played a round robin tournament against all the different difficulty settings. 
and I recorded the percentage win rate between all the different bots, right? So this is what came out and that's completely in line with my intuition. So if I have a random bot that does random things, that should be the worst. So random had a 3% win rate. Sometimes it's very, very seldom, but sometimes random just builds this amazing initial build order and rushes down the enemy. You can't avoid that. So random did win sometimes followed by easy bot, then medium bot, then expert bot, and then by the alpha beta and MCTS players. Okay. So the different difficulty settings, when the bots play against themselves in a tournament, they do actually fit those difficulty settings. It like, it's almost a linear increase in difficulty, which was pretty cool. Next, what I wanted to do is test to see if, if adding more time to the AI systems thinking actually made it harder and it did. So here I have alpha beta and Monte Carlo tree search. And the number at the end here is the number of milliseconds I gave it to think, right? So if you let the AI only think for a hundred milliseconds versus a second versus three seconds versus seven seconds, you know, it gets stronger and stronger, but that doesn't mean that if you gave it an hour, it will be like perfect, right? Because it's still only, um, choosing stuff from the portfolio, but I just wanted to make sure that more time generally meant that it got better. So that's, that's fine. That's all, that's all well and good, but I wanted to see how well it played against humans, right? So I had the AI play secretly in the arena. So I had, a, I did a 48 hour experiment where when the game was being played by humans during the beta phase, I wrote my own custom version of the client that queued up on the ladder as the AI. And I didn't even tell the owners of the game that I was doing this. I wanted it to be completely secret so that nobody would mess with it or, or leak it. So the bot would queue up um, and it would enter a game and the master bot with three seconds setting was used. However, what I did was, because it would be very obvious to anyone playing against a bot who like, the AI just does all it, it thinks for the same amount of time and then it like does all its moves at once. So what I did was I added a random delay to the actions of the bot so that it would click some units quickly, click other units. Like it looked like a human was thinking and it would unclick and reclick and all that sort of thing. So in the 48 hours that I ran the experiment, not a single person, um, like what caught on to it or thought that it was a uh, thought that it was like a, an AI playing on the ladder. And it achieved a rank of 6.5 out of 10. At the time we had a ranked, uh, like a, a, a system of tiers and the bot achieved within the top 25% of players during that experiment. But after that experiment, a number of improvements were made to the bot and the sort of the consensus amongst the game's designers and among the game's expert players is that the bot was probably as strong as the top 10%. So in the 90th percentile of human players, right? So before you ever got into like the MMR portion of the ranking system or got into the top hundred or whatever, that's sort of where the bot was. But human players are still way stronger than the bot, okay? But the really cool thing about this was that even non-expert players were able to beat the AI system when they knew they were playing against the AI. So, so this is the coolest thing that I took, up, took out of this whole situation is that players played against the AI thousands and thousands of times and the AI had some very specific weaknesses. So for example, if a player, the, the bot was very sort of next turn reactive where it wasn't able to see too far into the future. So if you were just playing standard and like buying a little bit of attack every turn, the bot was pretty strong. But some players realize that if they saved up resources over the course of a couple of turns and then bought everything on one turn, which is actually pretty suboptimal, but it really confused the bot. And it was a way that you could sort of get free wins on the bot if you did it correctly. And people like, you know, hard coded these build orders that they found the bot was weak against and all sorts of crazy stuff. But those same people 
who had a nearly 100% winning rate against the bot because when they were when they knew they were playing against it as soon as they played against it in secret and they didn't know it was the bot and they played sort of a more standard game they were now losing to the bot so when you were playing against the bot in a sort of standard way and not opponent modeling it and not exploiting its exact weaknesses it was it was actually pretty strong so that 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 was what i took out of this experiment it was a pretty cool experiment so i also did a user survey um, i asked six questions about the ai system every question was answered one to seven where one was the most negative seven was the most positive and i got about 100 responses and so the questions were um, what is your overall experience with the Prismata AI? Um, and so that one got a, a mean of 5.5. So people had an overall pretty uh, good experience with the AI. People really thought that the AI was a great tool for uh, learning the game as a new player. So that was excellent because that was one of our primary design goals. Um, people were sort of split on whether or not it was a good uh, practice tool for experienced players because it did have these sort of weaknesses that people could exploit. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as strong as the best human players. Um, most people thought that the AI for Prismata was stronger than the AI for other games. So for example, most people thought that the AI for Prismata was stronger than the AI for Hearthstone. So that was pretty cool because that's a Blizzard game. And I made an AI that was stronger than the Blizzard AI for Hearthstone. So I like that. Um, this one was not really a failure, but not as strong as I wanted it to be, is that the difficulty of the AI matches the bot descriptions. So a few people had comments here where it was like, the master bot really isn't a master, right? But I didn't have any real say in like how the, the designers of the game wanted to call the bots, for example. But... Their overall experience with the AI compared to similar games, similar strategy games, they really liked the AI system. So I was really, um, I was really, you know, happy with, with how the AI system for Prismata actually worked. And in the many, many years that the game has been out, um, I've never had to tweak the AI for any balance patches. It just works. So that's pretty cool. All right. So were the goals achieved for the AI system? The new player tutorial, definitely, I think that was a success. Experienced player training, maybe not, right? Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. They could test their build orders in secret against the AI, but the AI maybe doesn't put up a good enough fight for the world's best players. Uh, people said that it was a really good experience to play against, so the single player um, replay value was good. And uh, I thought the modular design was, it, it really worked out way better than I thought it would. So some of the final thoughts um, was that, you know, a lot of people in AI for games look at this and they say, well, you gave an AI three seconds to think, of course it's going to be good, right? If you're playing like, you know, Grand Theft Auto, you can't have the like the AI systems think for three seconds before it does something. Um, but my, in my opinion, you know, you can use HPS. It doesn't have to be an online game behavior you know, it could be used offline for QA as well. So you could do things like bug testing or balance testing. Like if you don't have the cycles to spare online, then you could use this stuff offline as well. So um, there's my, you know, I showing my email and stuff, but uh, prismata.net is the website for the game if you want to go look. And so that was the talk that I gave. I thought the AI was a success. Um, something that was not in that talk that I have done since then is this. So the Prismata AI engine, two years ago, after the game sort of reached, you know, it was in sort of financial decline at this point, I asked the company, can I open source the AI engine for the game? Because I think it would, you know, a lot of people would like to see it, would like to use it um, for research or whatever. And so here it is. It's, um, it's just my GitHub slash Prismata AI. And so the, the really cool thing about this from an implementation point of view, uh, this it has its own, um, you can play it. So the AI system for Prismata is written in C++, but the game is essentially a Flash game, okay? So it was written in like 
I can't remember what it's called. It was originally in a browser using Flash, but then it used Adobe's, like it was the same thing that the League of Legends um, user interface used to be written in. I can't remember the name of it now. But essentially, think of Adobe Flash, but the AI system was written in C++. And so it was written in C++ because I wanted it to be as fast as possible. Adobe Air, you're right, thank you. Someone in the chat use Adobe Air. So the game is written in Adobe Air, which uses like its action script or something like that. The AI is written in C++. So the way that the AI works for the, for the Windows Steam version of the game is that the AI is compiled to an executable file. Then when the Adobe Air client wants to make an AI move, it creates a JSON object of the current state of the game. It serializes that. It calls the executable file with that as standard input. The executable file spits out the move to standard output. The Adobe Error Engine captures that standard output and then does the move in the game. So the AI system is actually a completely standalone executable, which is pretty cool. And that means that if you download the source code for the AI engine, you can edit it, compile your own executable, and replace the in-game's AI system with your own standalone executable, which, as far as I know, has never been done in any other AI game, and I was, I was pretty proud of that. So um, the C++ AI uh, comes with its own um, SFML uh, user interface. So if you're familiar with this course, you know how the UI works using SFML. You can play it entirely within C++. Um, I think, does it come with an executable? No, it doesn't. So you'd have to compile it using Visual Studio. Um, it, you know, has a little tutorial here. You can watch that presentation that I, that I gave. Um, there are also uh, the publications about this. So um, here's actually the publication that I had in Game AI Pro about the Prismata AI system. Um, there's also uh, an academic paper which details all of the, uh, the algorithms and the results of the tests and stuff like that. So um, that's it. That's the Prismata AI. It's there, you can, you can use it, you can play the game. And uh, I don't know, I thought it was pretty cool. Hopefully you do too. And so I will have a question or two about Prismata and the uh, HPS on, on the quiz on Thursday. So just keep that in mind. All right, thanks to everyone for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.